and we're live welcome everybody for the appropriate culture podcast where we have another fantastic guest today and the guest that we have today is my friend alex pearl i'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction a little bio before we get things started here and so for alex pearl he actually attended college at washington state university where he majored in broadcast journalism and was on the path to becoming a newscaster but upon graduating he decided that news was a was spun too negatively for him and didn't want to be around that energy. In college, he also experimented with psychedelics, which uh, opened his mind, but too much of a good thing ended up being a bad thing. So Alex went completely sober for a year to recalibrate. After college, he became the top door-to-door salesman in the nation of Greenpeace, fundraising to save Arctic wolves and the rainforest of Indonesia. While rocking it out in Greenpeace, he met his current girlfriend who convinced him to quit his job and become a traveling comedian. She's a rather adventurous person and bikes from Oregon to Florida by herself. Alex was up for an adventure, so he and her lived out out of out of Alex's car and performed sketch comedy up and down Washington and Oregon for three months. She booked the venues and Alex wrote the shows. Uh, It was an epic time. After that, Alex and Olivia moved to Hawaii, where a Greenpeace connection led him to selling sustainable bamboo homes. In Hawaii, Alex rediscovered his love for fitness. He loved it so much that he even became a personal trainer. Alex loved living in Hawaii and met some amazing people, but had some had to move back had to move back because he missed his family so much. He didn't know how much family meant until he moved away. Alex Pearl now is now a personal trainer and trains in Eugene, Oregon. He is passionate about fitness, adventure, and locally sourced food. Alex, how are you doing, my friend? Wow, thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Sorry I didn't edit that down for you. Or oh, you're good, edit. dude. You're I'm good. I words. mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm even thinking, like, that probably wasn't even, like, all of it. That was probably just a snippet, which goes to show me you, <laughs> you, you've been busy. How's it going? Thank you. Good, man. Good. Yeah, loving life, improving every year. It's, life's going in the right direction for me, so I guess I'm doing something right. I mean, that mask is doing something, right? What's with the, <laughs> what's, what's, what's with the outfit? I mean, I know, I mean, are you, are you protecting yourself from COVID right now? Uh, I'm protecting myself from computer viruses, actually. Okay, and, there uh, we go. And, you know, just in case uh, you got a PC police washing, mm-hmm. you know, kind of want to hide my identity. But you already said I like my that. name. So I guess they can find me anyways. If you, you've already blown that cover, dude. Yeah. If, if you're all right, though, I'll take the mask off. Yeah, no, nah, man. Hey, whatever makes you comfortable. Uh, I mean, I understand that nowadays, you know, we all are having our uh, identities. Uh, some people tend to switch them up and down and showcase different aspects online and different aspects in real life but i think yeah. people like to see your face you have a good face oh thank you i like i like your face that. you know you're, look, you're a good looking dude so we thank might as you. well let let the people see who we're talking to you so too. um where are you right now so i'm you, in so eugene. eugene so eugene is um it's down i-5 uh it's pretty much in the middle of oregon two hours south of portland um and I, I've been just loving it here. There's so many swimming holes. So um, I've been swimming a ton. And uh, that's the thing I miss the most about living in Hawaii was I was snorkeling every day. Nice. And so I recently learned that uh, crawfishing or swimming underwater and catching crawdads or crawfish yeah. is a lot like snorkeling. Okay. You know, I put on snorkel gear, kind of searching around, looking for fish except they're little crawfish. There's also little fish swimming around. So it's really good because it's kind of itched my swimming bug. So is that, are you actually eating some of these foods that you catch? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's what I'm yeah. talking about. They're like uh, shrimp. Hey. They, they taste a lot like shrimp, a little less meat, but man, there's some Godzilla ones that uh, sometimes I don't catch them. I saw one that was huge yesterday it had a tail like this big and it must have been like this big and yeah i crawled too deep under a rock i couldn't get it so i'll go back next time and maybe grab him so do you find an additional pleasure from eating the foods that you catch yourself as opposed oh, to the ones yeah. that you just yeah tell me, tell me about that so this whole pandemic thing uh kind of scared me 
I was all right eating mostly local food from my time in Hawaii. We had friends who owned a store called Locavore and it was all locally sourced food. So we were eating uh, local fruit, you know, local veggies, local meat, local coffee, everything local. Um, and then I tried to bring that into Seattle and it was a little harder just being in the city. I had to go to the grocery stores. Yeah. And then coming to Eugene, I was like, I don't want to go to Costco anymore. I don't want to go to Safeway, any grocery store. So I've been going to farmers, buying local food. Um, we, and we also grow our own veggies here in our backyard. So we got carrots, celery, cabbage. Um, and I'm trying to get to the point where I'm able to hunt. I'm able to fish, scuba dive, uh, basically provide for myself and uh, be more independent from the system because the system kind of scares me. Like okay. going into Costco, uh, during the pandemic and I, when this whole thing started, uh, I was experimenting with, um, microdosing acid. Okay. And I went into Costco, like on a microdose and it was so intense. They're just, everyone stands six feet apart. Everyone's buying up toilet paper, loudspeakers going off. Some people are wearing masks. It was just not a good vibe right. to be a part of. And I was like, Oh my God. So like, I'm way too reliant on places like Costco for stuff. I need to get out, probably get out of the city, which I did, and then uh, quit my Costco membership, which we accomplished. Yeah. And they just contacted my girlfriend and I saying, hey, it's time to renew. And we're like, we haven't been to Costco in months. Yeah. So we're not going to renew. You know, all the Costco, it's great deals, but it comes from everywhere but where I am whenever I look at where the food is from. So, I, and this was all in uh, Eugene? Yeah, um, this, so I moved to Eugene in uh, November, well, August. It took two months to find the house. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, in the, I was in Seattle for the first year of the pandemic until August. And so, you know, I saw the, I, I went to Chaz, Chad. Um, I saw the city change. I saw um, a lot of homeless people uh, doing whatever they wanted. Um, I saw the police stop responding to 911 calls at my gym I worked at, you know, the when there was just girls in the gym, because the gym reopened, you know, yeah. in the summer. Uh, homeless people would come into the gym and they would have to stand them down because uh, there was no males around to intimidate them. And they had to stand them down with pepper spray. Wow. Not, they didn't use the pepper spray, but. But like that, they so like. Come. Yeah. They had to like, pull out the pepper yeah, spray. Yeah, they was out, ready to go. Yeah. And that happened wow. two days in a row to the same females. <laughs> it's like, this is crazy. I and mean, then I had to deal with them too. Like, and is this, this is right in the heat of things in 2020? Yeah. Yeah. This like is March, of, April. Yeah. So things just started to get obvious, go obviously downhill uh, in Seattle. It's a beautiful city and I love it, but um, this okay, is downtown so Seattle. You were, okay, so this is all in, you experienced this in downtown Seattle. This is okay. all down, yeah. and this is what prompted the move. Oh, I, so you just moved to Oregon. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Wow, Sorry, I didn't okay. give you a timeline. No, no, I mean, it's fine. I'm, I'm, it, this means that we were living in downtown Seattle or seattle area at the yeah. same time wow so i was in green lake and i would work in downtown okay techies where in downtown um, so uh, Belltown. go for it oh Belltown. okay so you're a little bit up north um funny enough so the spot that i just left is a spot that i'm going to be uh, reuniting with for the next few months until mm -hmm. i move again but that spot is in pioneer oh that's a beautiful area it is. It got a little bit, you know, run yeah, down with the. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying, dude. It's ah, fuck, dude. Like, it's that area is beautiful. It has a nice little park. It has a nice mm -hmm. area with Chinatown, just being a yeah. couple blocks away. But a hundred percent, almost a hundred percent, taken over by the homeless population. And, and so, it, at this point, it's more than just peeing, dude. It's like. <laughs> It's, it, unfortunately, it's, I have a hard time trying to be, I guess, 
I don't want to use the word respectful because it just is what it is. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like you're trying to be disrespectful if you're just, if you're just naming what happened and what is going on. And if a person thinks that that's rude, it is what it is, you know, so take it or leave it type of thing. But yeah, it's rough out there, man. Like when you moved, so I could tell you my answer, but mm -hmm. when you decided to move, what was the primary reason that made you want to make that final, that, that made you go over the fence and be like, I'm out of here? Uh, you, you know, it was just uh, kind of felt a little um, trapped and a, uh, a little too reliant on the uh, city. Um, and, you know, I, so what if the grocery stores stop serving food? Right. Like, what if, oh, like, I'm screwed. Or what if a riot becomes, like, very serious or, uh, you know, someone overwhelms my home or something. Well, the police aren't really doing much. They're upset. Right. And the, the response time was already extremely high. You know, the response time here in Eugene is 10 minutes. Uh, in Seattle, it's over an hour. Wow. You know? Or not at all. I had clients who told me there was a shooting outside their condo. They called the police and the police said they weren't going to come. And this was in the heat of the BLM, um, you know, good cause, but yeah. a lot of collateral damage. But answer me this, though. It seems like Oregon, in many ways, is in a just as deep, if not deeper, than Washington. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely Portland. Portland, um, yeah. But Eugene, we still have a homeless issue. We have huge homeless camps. But these homeless people seem more uh, down on their luck than the ones I met in um, Seattle. The ones sure. in Seattle just, a, a lot of the ones I would meet seem so out of it, so far gone. Oh it's yeah. like they were in a different world. Zombies. Yeah, exactly. Zombies, yeah. The ones in Oregon that I have met and I've talked to and they're friendly, you know, they're like the traditional homeless person that, you know, maybe you remember from the 90s or 2000s. Sure. Like, Oh, I don't know. This guy lost his job and, uh, or he got into wife left or him or yeah, yeah, something like that. And just, uh, down on his luck. So that's much different. We still get the occasional, you know, drugged out homeless person, but, um, where, where I live, it's very nice neighborhood. It's more on the outskirts of Eugene. If I lived in downtown Eugene, um, I would have a higher crime rate to deal with more break-ins. Okay. Things like that. But I live, um, pretty close to nature there's like the country is right next door um there's nature hikes that are five minutes away so it's pretty much the highlands is here where all the rich people live right. i'm right there right next to them okay so yeah i just kind of moved my way farther. you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so so okay so when we so a little bit of background for the for the viewers uh, we went to high school together. Yep. Um, and you're one year older than me. Yep. As far as I know. And so we had a lot of the same, like, overlapping friends. I mm -hmm. think that's kind of how we met each other. Yep. Um, and then, so from talking to you a little bit, it seems like you ended up going towards journalism after high school. And so what I want to, like, I want to ask sort of like a, like a, like a two-part question, mm -hmm. but going off of what we were already talking about from the last year 2020 in regards to the autonomous zone the blm stuff you know whatever else whatever else was going on with that did you personally see any inadequacies with how the reporting was being done on the tv as far as what was, <laughs> what was showing up and as yeah, opposed definitely. to what you were seeing and then two did you experience that sort of priming when you were going to school for sort of, did you feel like you were going to walk into the same situation that you just saw here in 2020, that you're going to be like more or less just another piece in this puzzle? Like, yeah. break that down real quick. Well, um, so as a newscaster, I was rewarded for uh, sensationalism or taking a story and making it bigger sure. than what it was and also making it scary. So what I saw with the um, BLM was uh, one side Fox News playing it up 
acting like the city of Seattle was on fire. Sure. And then the other side playing it down. Um, like it's not, not too much is happening. Yeah. Like it, not too much is happening. So you have uh, mainstream news is very biased perspectives. And um, at the end of the day, a news person's a storyteller is what I learned. You're trying to tell uh, what story is going to best serve uh, the investors yeah. uh, of uh, your news station. Right. So, you know, there's um, various cultures of the news stations, and you kind of subconsciously know what the culture is and what stories to say. Um, and I. I stopped watching news until that this last year because the news suddenly was in my backyard and suddenly affected me. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, they got me. They got me because the news is right there. So of course I went to see these things in person, you know, of curiosity. Right. And I, I got a vibe for uh, what was going on. Why well, I break that down. Um, what was the vibe? You know, it was, it was weird because it was like a tense kind of um, is partially like felt like a uh, cultural uh, music festival of, um, you know, talking about uh, oppression of black people in America um, and kind of a nice way to get together and talk about those things. But then um, also uh, that area of Capitol Hill already has gang violence. There is already shootings that were happening there. Right. And there's already lots of drug deals going on. And, and I, my whole issue, my main issue with the movement was those problems are so blaringly obvious of black on black violence. And that is what was happening there. But we're focusing on police violence, which I think black on black violence, police violence is more of a symptom of, you know, a larger problem in um, the black uh, community, which, you know, I, I do believe uh, there are uh, elite people that also try to keep people down. And right. the black community has been targeted uh, for that. And I think that um, Democrat funders are probably on the side of BLM that also try to keep them down sure and there's a lot of uh cobwebs on both sides and it's this is just looking at uh some history well i mean what's funny is in many ways there's a lot to unpack here right yeah it's, it's like and, you know you know what i mean like it is, <laughs> there's just so many layers to just even like the last 10 seconds that you just said and so I'm not trying to, you know, sort of take away because I still want to hear the rest of what if that if that was all of it. But I mean, if, uh, if it isn't like fill me in on what what's the overall take, of the um, the vibe. Well, my my overall take was I was involved in uh, Greenpeace and there was clashes like this uh, as well. Less uh, obviously less violent. There you'd hear about more. Sure. Um, but what I see a lot of is uh, demonization of the other side and right, right. lack of um, conversation. So when um, we were uh, trying to shut down pipelines and different things like that uh, at Greenpeace and hearing the other side um, made me have more empathy towards them and realize if we shut these pipelines down, these people don't have jobs. And right. we aren't we aren't giving them a replacement. Sure. So I think in you know if if we work together more, but instead the Greenpeace was demonizing industry, industry is demonizing Greenpeace, and yeah. the same way you know cops are being demonized who are essential workers. Right. You know, in any society. Um, I, and so it seems to me personally that the media is a big component of the demonization. Meaning, sure, we are all individuals who, who decide what we do and what we say and what we believe. That being said, man, if I were to put the blame on a player that's sort of leading the frontier with that attitude of like separation and tribalization, and uh, like, like you said, demonization of individuals, 
Mm-hmm. I mean, do you have, and obviously share it at your, your discretion, but any situation where you could, you already talked about how the schooling system for journalism was teaching you how to essentially blow things out of proportion. Well, and you know, that's, it's, it, that's the thing is news is entertainment. Right. And, um, I, I don't, they weren't overtly saying these things. It was more like this Covert. story is getting a reaction. Right. Which is good, which makes me feel good. You know, I was able to make something on television that was entertaining enough to get people talking about it. Right. Now, on a separate level, when you went home, obviously through, through your bio, it was clear that you weren't really jiving with that with that that energy but on a real level and a more specific you know per se when you were led to do these things and paint those types of stories um how did it make you feel though when you were done working like did you feel proud of the work did you feel like it was like what did it so i was able to um figure out how to sensationalize things to such a way that they were funny. Like I was like, North Korea is at it again. They're blasting nuclear, like they're blasting missiles into the ocean. What will Kim Jong-un do next? You know, make it more comical. So I was proud that I was able to make people laugh and like actually poke fun at, oh yeah, we're just like trying to scare people with Kim Jong-un. You know, we're just pulling out for fear. It's, It's funny and and, and a, but then there's there's some dumb people who really just believe this stuff yeah and you know that people could tell i was joking because of my uh you know tone but that that is real news if i was out there i wouldn't i would not be paid to joke in that way right and what i saw is my colleagues uh in the news they ended up having to report on shootings whole week long just talk about shootings, talk about like if, if, you know, a school shooting happened or whatever. And I'm not even hearing about these shootings. They're not affecting me. My life is so good. Mm -hmm. But imagine if I had to work in the news industry, I would be so depressed and anxious right? because I would have to talk about that. And I knew that I'd have to talk about that because the biggest story while I was at Wazoo was like a teacher, like assaulting a student. And that's all we talked about for a while Um, right and and i i was like this is just what's going to happen in real life if if there's ever a a rape case or something really big or shooting i don't want to talk about that all the time that's not my life you know that's so it's a rare occurrence and so i mean i want to dive in a little bit different on on this subject because to me this is something that is like (laughs) It's taken over the country in regards of sort of creating these two teams, mm-hmm. uh, and we can we can apply this to almost any topic: uh, politics, uh, Corona, um, you know, what whatever. You know, there's always seems like seems to be like the yeah. this this two side, right? Either you're for it or you're against the type of thing, and like you said, depending on the news news station that you watch, they will very much portray a very biased one way or another uh, idea. Do you see this damage affecting sort of the entire country or is it mainly just certain certain states? Is, it, is this like a bigger problem than I think it is? Uh, I definitely think it is. I, I think it's uh, it, it messes with people's thinking because they think of ideas as black and white when ideas are very nuanced. And I think social media also has something to do with that because like Twitter, you have to have a, a quick quick little clever tweet, you know, bash the other side. There's a lot of, uh, what, uh, I don't know the right word, but people are like cleverly, um, clever comebacks, you know? Sure. Um, smart asses. Yeah. It's a lot of smart asses and you know, Twitter only lets you type a little paragraph. So that's all you have time for. And so the news, the, uh, the media, the just quick clickbait, it seems like it is uh, making us forget, you know, how to talk things out. And then also just desensitization 
whereas you don't see someone's emotions online when you're talking to them. Right. So I, I think, cause I see people when I go on Facebook, I'll see people post like really mean things about, um, whatever side, you know, Democrats, Republicans. Sure. And I'm like, man, I know this person. I've never heard them talk this way. Right. It's like this, this, how do, does this have any weight? No, it doesn't. It's, this is a, it, this person shouldn't be saying these things. They should be talking, talking it out with the other side. Right. Who, instead of just blasting it into cyberspace. So do you think it's a, uh... Do you think it's a bit easier for the average person to bring out that side of them when they're not doing that in person? Oh yeah, definitely. Cause if you say some of those things in person, you know, you run, you could run the risk of being punched in the face. Yeah. Even. Um, but also, you know, most people are pretty kind that we grew up with and that we know, and you can see someone's facial expressions when you're hurting someone's feelings. Right. You know, and you might, um tone it down right right yeah it's something we learned in elementary school right (laughs) i was just thinking i there's an elementary school near my house all the kids are wearing masks all day i don't know i wonder what effect that has that they are wearing masks all day on dude can you imagine can you imagine us going to school (laughs) wearing masks all day i feel so glad i did (laughs) like i mean going going back to uh, middle school, high school area. I mean, cause you, you, you went to school with Jake, right? Yeah. Okay. So middle Jake, school. yeah, Jake was our first podcast guest. And, uh, yep. Yeah. And so I actually believe I probably got around to meeting you and, mm-hmm. and getting to know you and the other guys through him. And so he was telling me about not only one, the experience at Chaz, in Seattle yeah. and all that, which he also ended up moving out of there. I think he's back now, but uh, he was telling me also that he is, he went down the whole ayahuasca road oh, yeah. and messed around with different psychedelics. And that's an area of your life that you seem to be able to experience a little bit. Uh, at what point did that come in after so, journalism? Uh, so I experienced, I started out, um, after freshman year of college, I um, ate four grams of mushrooms and went to the forest. Okay, choose to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, the trees were alive. I, I felt their energy. I was just very, I was like hugging the trees. I was seeing life grow out of dead trees. Uh, I, I was, the, I remember when the come up happened, you know, when you realize you're like, when shit goes, when shit yeah. goes off, yep, yep, yep. So when shit went off, um, the trees they like vibrated to me. They, they were like, "Hey, Alex, we're so glad you're here. <laughs> Welcome to the party." I'm like, "Oh my gosh, you trees been partying this whole time?" So they're like, "Yeah. What else do you think we do?" <laughs> they're like, basically, the energy of a party, which is you know, love and good vibes. That's what trees are. And they're just pure energy, you know, from the sun, from the earth, kind of like this orgasmic energy, uh, which makes sense because there's a lot of trees. It's probably pretty cool being a tree. They're kind of like uh, enlightened beings. <laughs> sure. And that that was my takeaway from that. And also my takeaway was I ate the um, I ate the shrooms in a uh, McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> but after that i was like i'm never eating mcdonald's again it is uh, gross and i also went to a safeway while on that and the vibes were so bad at safeway yeah you know coming from the forest to the safeway i was like man everyone's just all materialistic here and they aren't even looking at each other they're just like Arr. walking around getting their groceries so it, it goes that just open my mind to a whole new realm of energy and subtle energy that I didn't notice on the regs. And so it's funny you mentioned that because <clears throat> I've messed around with some uh, microdosing. Mm-hmm. Um, and on a personal level, I always say that I'm still not completely down with 
the idea of uh, pushing people towards doing it just to do it for entertainment. Yeah. But um, I do believe that if you come in with a goal of growth and whatever it is that you're trying to work on, if it's a certain problem you're trying to get over, if it's a certain fear, you know, whatever it is, um, a craft, an artistic yeah. craft that you're, you know, all of that. That's definitely the more appropriate. Yeah, exactly. Use of them. Right. And so when you, when you were messing around with it, were you ever doing microdosing as well, or were you just doing sort of regular doses and from time to time? I was doing all doses. So I uh, had an addictive personality growing up and I was a junk food addict uh, through high school and um, freshman year of college. I was eating six meals a day of donuts, pizzas, Damn. junk food. And in middle school, high school, I was eating all this junk food. Um, and I didn't think it was affecting me because I was still so fast, you know, so fit. Right. I thought, um, I thought my purpose in life was to eat junk food and like not get fat from it. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's kind of weird. And I thought I was just had really good genetics or something. Um, and then I combined that addiction for junk food with addiction for psychedelics. And I started using them way too much um, on just because I love the feeling. It made me feel like a little kid again. Sure. And eventually I burned out really hardcore. I was also drinking. So I became almost a, a full-blown drug addict by my yeah. senior year. And my freshman year on television at college, uh, I was called the one take wonder because I never messed up my lines. Senior year, I could hardly talk. I could, I would mess up all the time. Talking just like we're doing was yeah. very hard for me. I fried my brain. Mm. Um, and so that's why after senior year of college, I took a year to be completely sober. Uh, no substance, no alcohol, no marijuana, no psychedelics. Um, and that's when I started running. And I uh, ended up getting health issues from all the junk food I ate. I, I was right. covered in rashes. You know, you, I, my whole face was um, red and peeling. Wow. So, so a kind of a gift I had was I was a good looking guy. Well, suddenly I was no longer able to use that. And Out was, the window, yeah. Yeah. So that led me, that was the start of my fitness path because I was so depleted. I was like, felt suicidal and that I would go on a run and I could hardly run. I, I had pretty much lost my, all my identity because I was no longer athletic like I was in, you know, growing up. Right. I was no longer good looking to myself because I had uh, eczema all over my face. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, imagine just losing every, losing your ability to speak or be clever. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Your energy. That's like yeah. your whole self right there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, from 25 on, it was really, I was on a healing trajectory of, uh, I started out going to the farmer's market and eating whole foods. And that's when my whole kind of eating more local began. And I got a juicer you know, I was juicing veggies, fruits and yeah. veggies, and uh, just uh, completely transformed myself uh, over the years um, and became obsessed with health and fitness slowly but surely. So that was from 25 to, you know, 30. Okay. And it was so cool to get to 30 and be like, wow, I'm so much more energetic, so much smart, so much stronger, so much faster than I've ever been. Yeah. So I reversed aged by uh, changing my lifestyle completely. So let's, let's dive into that because <clears throat> I personally have been on the same road uh, in regards to feeling better than what I did in my late teens, and early twenties in regards to now. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say are some of the biggest contributing factors to you getting on this road that has uh, allowed you to essentially you know, not necessarily maybe age backwards, but at least slow it down by a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all, it's all really important. It all adds up. Uh, definitely cutting out the junk food. It's the main thing. Um, but the, and then exercising, quitting all the 
drugs. Um, you know, I, when I was healing myself, I'd run every single morning, sweat. So that's movement, eating natural foods, um, sleeping enough, you know, just getting in touch with my body, reducing overall stress. Just, it's just, it all adds up. I can't say, I, I can't say one thing. If I were to choose one thing, I'd probably go with uh, sleep and stress reduction first. Uh, okay. But food, I think, is probably more important because it was these bad foods that were uh, triggering my eczema. Okay. Pizza. Pizza was like the biggest trigger. Uh, and I can eat pizza. I can eat all these foods now. I had a leaky gut is what if you've ever heard of that. I have not. I mean, I, I'm sure if it is what it sounds like, or is it something more than what it is in regards to the actual just definition? <laughs> I, think it, I think it's what it is like food particles are supposed to not go through your gut and into okay. your bloodstream. But my gut was so damaged from um, the six meals a day of junk food uh, that things were, uh, you know, I don't, I don't understand it totally. I don't even think my doctors understand it totally. I went to a normal doctor first. They gave me skin cream. Right. I went to, that didn't work. That made it worse. I went to a naturopath. They gave me a bunch of supplements and I didn't want to spend money on supplements all day. Uh, like vitamins and stuff. Right. I went to another naturopath. She did the same thing. Finally, I just healed it by using uh, common sense and eating natural foods and just listening to my body. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about that for a second because I did it. Uh, I did an episode with my father who is getting his PhD in uh, nutrition, essentially, mm -hmm. and um, a big part of the whole podcast was talking about how there's all this fluff in the in the health industry. Mm -hmm of all these things that you should and need to do in order to get this perfect result yeah. or whatever. Good marketing. So you, I guess this is a good leeway. You are working in the personal, um, um, training, yeah. personal training area right now. This would kind of go with your line of work and against it depending on how you do your line of work right if you're the type of trainer who's like you got to take this and this and this and that yeah I'm not what that what way. what's your what's your approach with your with your clients so uh i did get a fitness nutrition certification as well so what i basically do is i monitor what they're already eating and then um make suggestions on how they should, how they could change and switch those out with whole healthy alternatives. So if, example is if a client has a sweet tooth, I recommend them to eat organic berries. Okay. Um, and berries should be organic because they have thin skins. So they have a high um, pesticide. They can get pesticide residue. Got it. Okay. So I teach them about the dirty dozen and the clean 15. Uh, have you ever heard of that? No. Well, your viewers might have not either. Um, Let's get into it. So basically, um, they update this every year. They take all the crops and they test for pesticide residues, how much of it is, how much pesticide still on the food when you're mm -hmm. going to eat it, right? So every year it changes and you can look it up, but um, the clean 15 is the um, fruits and veggies that have the lowest amount of pesticides. Okay. Number one is avocado. Okay. Cut open avocado, you know, the skin's pretty thick. They don't need that much pesticide to grow it. The highest pesticide food would be strawberries. Okay. For some reason they have to spray it a lot. The pesticide stays on the skin. You're eating the skin. So right. if, if you don't want to look up the clean 15 or dirty dozen, but I recommend everyone do that. Um, you can just think if it's thin skin and you eat the skin, then it it's probably high. has pesticides on it. So Got like it. apples ha usually have a lot of pesticides. Pears. Yep. Yep. Pears. Um, and I don't Grape, have the list grapes. memorized. Yeah. Grapes actually do, which is unfortunate because a lot They're of times they, they come. Yeah. It's kind of hard to find organic grapes. And I'll still eat, you know, from the dirty dozen. Uh, it's just about 
knowing that you are and knowing that you are going to be consuming some pesticides that your body has to detoxify. Okay. And try not to do too many. Is banana on the top clean? You know, banana's a weird one because um, they are they are clean, but um, they're something you don't want to buy organic, last I checked. And uh, this is because bananas are affected by a fungus, a very spreadable fungus. Um, and they're able to spray the bananas to get rid of the fungus, but organic bananas, they have to clear new uh, rainforest to okay. grow more organic bananas once the fungus comes, this very spreadable fungus. Okay. So uh, if that makes sense, they're able to keep the uh, sprayed banana trees, they're able to keep them producing, producing, but the organic ones they're gonna produce and then eventually the fungus is gonna come and then they have to go clear out some more rainforest to grow okay. more organic bananas. And last I checked that was, you know, three years ago. So I, I, you know, things change. Farming practices change. You can get organic bananas that say rainforest safe. And, you know, that's an organization that tries to protect the rainforest. Uh, but, you know, look us, if, don't take my word, on this stuff you can look this stuff up yourself because things do change right right just like the dirty dozen and clean 15s updated every year and so i i stress this a lot when it comes down to getting your own information where you, you need to go do your own research at the mm -hmm. end of the day like you can listen to all the podcasts that you want but aside from getting the information applying it when it comes down to applicable information when it comes down to getting your life on the, on a good healthy health track mm -hmm. regardless of what you're doing what would you give a person out there who is at that point in life where they are sort of at the enough is enough point yeah right i was there. Um, uh, yeah i'll say the you know the first two weeks were really hard and i felt worse so you have to recognize that if you've been eating junk food and not exercising, your body is not producing endorphins to make you feel good because it's not getting the proper nutrients to make you high on life. So my first two weeks, I, because I had done so many psychedelics regularly and ate so bad, I could not get high on life. Mm. That's why I was so low. After a while though, of uh, being healthy, I was high on life where I don't want to touch anything because I feel good. Right. You know, I have energy. So my clients, I ask them to eat foods that make them feel good. And I'll give them guidelines on how to eat so they can lose weight and change their body. Um, and they can do whatever diet they want. And I'll tell them, you know, there's, there's certain things for like weight loss you have to do. So weight loss, you either got to go high carb, low fat, high protein, or you got to go, let's see, high carb, low, yeah, or high fat, low carb, protein. For some reason, the, it does, the body doesn't work as well if you combine carbs and fats. Carbs and fats. Yeah. Okay. Um, and even for me, I try to uh, space out my carbs and proteins and, and fats into different meals. How, how different of meals are we talking here? Like every other meal you see one or the other or what's going on? Uh, you know, th I usually eat three meals a day. But like, how do you space out those, so those okay. factors within the meals? So I, uh, I like to start out with more carbs and fruits um, just because it makes me feel good. Uh, and it also hydrates me in the morning. It's very easy to digest these things. Okay middle of the day i like to do more of a protein source because that's um slower digestion and also i like to work out in the middle of the day so you know i gotta refeed my muscles um end of the day uh i find that a lighter meal works best um because you don't want food to interfere with your sleep right right um so you know that's when you know a uh, fish salad would be a good idea. Fish has a uh, taurine in it, which can help can help with sleep as well as other chemicals. But 
I also like to do fruit at nighttime. So start my day with fruit and my day with fruit. And that's for the liver glycogen. So before bed, if you eat fruit and you're, um, you know, you haven't ate anything heavy, um, the fruit will digest nicely and replace your liver glycogen. So if you sleep up, if you, you'll sleep through the night, you're less likely to wake up kind of like, uh, cause you'll run out of glycogen. This is like kind of hard for me to explain. So you I'm not, I'm not you'll wake up, you'll wake up like feeling more energized or more out of you, it. You might wake up in the middle of the night and kind of just stay awake. Oh, okay. Um, because you already, you, because you already got all your rest. Uh, no. Yeah. I, I, I'm not as comfortable talking about that. Uh, cause I don't understand this. I'm not able to describe the science fully, but no problem. Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. If you eat fruit at night, it can help you stay asleep and stay in a restful state the whole night. Okay. Instead of waking up at 3am kind of stressed, but, uh, but that's just try things out for yourself. Cause everyone's going to be a little different. Right. But for those people, cause I, you know, for some of us who we grew up playing sports and doing this and, you know, being able to like cheat on our, our diets and still look fine and yeah. feel, feel pretty good at the end of the day. But I've come to find out that a lot of people are not able to get away with that. They're not able to do those things and not okay. put on the pounds or, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like even people in our, our, our positions were able to have to like, you know, you weren't as good in sports or you weren't mm -hmm. acting as sharp during that one meeting or whatever. But for the people out there who are not able, they're not seeing themselves getting away with being able to have any of these circumstances, what, what would you say should be their next step to getting on track? Meaning, should they get professional help? Should they uh, go into like a self-teaching mentality where they're doing that on like YouTube types? Like what, what would you go about? Uh, Call yeah. you for being a trainer? <laughs> you know, what is it is. <laughs> they could, they could definitely do that. Um, I would start out uh, by going to the farmer's market. That's where I started out. I started out running on my own, doing body weight workouts. Yeah. And like push ups and pull ups and running and going to farmers markets and pretty much eating whatever my eyes and my stomach told me to eat. Mm -hmm. While also clearing out all the junk food from your house and treating it like a drug. Yeah. Like, you know, a drug addict probably should not have cocaine in their house. Right. You know, you should probably shouldn't have those cookies in your house. You're going to eat them. Yeah. And, and then you go into a farmer's market. Well, now you're less tempted um by the grocery store yeah because the grocery store the whole middle section is just food that's made to taste good but not be good for you and, and then um eventually your natural uh instincts will kick in and, and so easy let's let's dive into that part for a second because i've tried to explain this to certain people but i've had a hard time which is the aspect of just feeling what you're supposed to eat at mm -hmm. that time. So a lot of the health channels that I follow all come at you with a lot of the different scientific purposes as to why you should eat these things and so forth. And this is good for you. This is good for your skin. This is good for this. this is, and it's all good information. But at the end of the day, my primary source of decision making has come from really what my body feels like I should take in at that time. Yeah, your body and is just much smarter. So dive into that. Do you do you feel like you could break it down as to does if there's any science behind that? Do you feel like there's some legitimacy to that you can actually like make some points about it? Yeah. I well, first off that is uh the way i do it as well because your gut is so smart and it knows what it wants to eat now you may have a gut that is a little out of whack that's why it's hard to change your diet at first your nutrition at first because your gut probably is filled with stuff that wants to eat junk food but you know once you're able to listen to your gut and trust your gut and you've repopulated it with really healthy uh, bacteria 
from you know going to the farmer's market regularly or maybe doing a juice fast right something like this i did a juice fast and it was really helpful to reset my system um you know a fast a fast can be a great way to um get to know your body a little more and also you know kill off some of those creature bacteria in there that are just you know they're kind of controlling you they're telling you go buy this junk food right you know? but once they're gone um like you and me we eat pretty healthy so we are in touch with our body because the bacteria is good and it's telling us what to eat so i i trust my body uh hundred percent i trust it more than the internet or what someone says or a professional might say because it's right like today i felt oh i feel a little dehydrated it's pretty hot today hmm well i have a watermelon that's really hydrating right. i'll go eat that watermelon so i ate the watermelon felt really good or oh you know i don't feel really lively right now i think i need to breathe more i'll go on a jog and really get my heart rate going and you know breathe in more air and um bounce around you know get right. blood moving everywhere oh now i feel more lively so these are right. things that i'm just paying attention to in my body and you know i i'd say as someone disconnect from the internet and all those things and just be with yourself for um you know a good portion of the day so you actually know your body and, and know the signs because the body is saying things, but if you're not listening, or if you're, you know, a bad listener, um, then you're going to miss those things. Right. And that's why I let my clients have a lot of control over their diet or nutrition, um, because I don't want to act like I'm smarter than their body. And if things move in the right direction, they're getting more energy, they're losing weight, they're gaining more muscle, then that's great. That's what I'm looking for. So I always ask clients, do you feel better? That's the first thing. Second thing, are you, you know, gaining muscle or losing weight? That's usually people have one or one of those goals. Got it. And if that's good. We're good. <laughs> so do you, um, are, are all your clients local clients? Are you doing like online stuff too? Or how does that go? Uh, so I have about half my clients online and half my clients local. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I get them through Thumbtack which is a great website. Um, someone Googles online personal trainer or Eugene personal trainer, Thumbtack will pop up and then they'll see my profile uh, depending on how much money I paid Thumbtack. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And um, I monitor my client's nutrition through MyFitnessPal and I check in with them five days a week. So even if I'm not seeing them, I'm texting them and making sure that um, they're feeling good and also telling them if they've ate too much of a certain thing that is toxic um, or giving them a pat on the back if they ate really healthy and, you know, it looks good. And, of course, I make sure they're feeling good. Right. So it's, it's preventative medicine. So since we're coming up here on the, on the top of the hour, Give me like a breakdown of how your um, training system is from like an onboarding, like a, like a new client and working with them, depending on what their needs are. And we'll, uh, we'll close things off after that. Okay, cool. So first um, I asked them if they'd be open to a phone call and we just talk about their past and uh, their nutrition. Uh, has their current fitness routine been working out for them? what's good, what would they like to change? And then from there, we come up with a plan. I ask them what their budget is and uh, the plan is really catered towards their budget. So someone with a big budget, they're gonna have a lot more face time with me. Uh, I'm gonna be there to make sure they do their workouts. I'm gonna um, be there with them every day. Someone with uh, less of a budget, they're gonna hear from me maybe once a week you know, they might hang out with me for an hour, uh, once a month. So 
Yeah, it's, re it's really awesome because I'm able to service people that, you know, have a lot of money and then people who um, are just starting out and they don't have as much financial abundance right yet. But right. They get their energy up, they get their fitness up, you know, they make more money. I feel that, dude. I mean, one thing is for sure is that even if you don't, even if you, in your head you think you have zero money for it, it comes out how bad do you want it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're either going to go and get the knowledge yourself, by yourself, or you're going to go and you're going to make some money and hire somebody to walk you through it and make sure that they hold you yeah. accountable. And so you sort of got to take a pick at that point. And I did have personal trainers at one point in my uh, fitness journey before I was a trainer. Yeah. And, and this was in Hawaii. And they actually said to me after a year, they're like, you know, you're really good at this fitness thing you should consider being a personal trainer. And I had not considered it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that would be an awesome job. And here I am. <laughs> rewarding? Oh yeah, so rewarding. I had a client who lost 50 pounds since January. Damn. Yeah, he wow. feel, feels very good. Energy much higher. Uh, now I have another client who's gained 30 pounds of muscle since January. Damn. So yeah, pretty serious uh, results. And a bunch of people have got their first pull-up this year with me. I've had uh, gir several girls get their first pull-up. Okay. That's a big deal, you know? <laughs> so do you got like, uh, you got any any challenges like that, that you put out? Like where? I, you know, that's actually the next step for making more money in this okay. profession. Uh, I, I do not have much of an online presence right now. So I'm trying to make sure that I don't get complacent, you know, cause I'm able to pay all my bills and put money away. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the, the ceiling is endless in personal training or anything right. when you're an entrepreneur, any training really. Yeah. yeah. So I just have to, um, stay motivated, think, think big, have big goals and yeah, doing those challenges, you can make like a lot of money that people make, you know, launch a challenge, you're, you can make over 10,000. I'm sure. Really yeah. Easily I mean, in a month. if it goes viral, yeah. Um, a hundred percent. And so, I mean, off of that note, being that you're telling me that you don't have much of a social media presence, where can people find you on social media? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can find me at, at Alex Pearl of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> okay word. i think that's i think that's I'll, I'll, i'm is. gonna i'm gonna link everything in the description so but yeah just like yeah, just let let them know yeah okay, send perfect. me a dm you know if you want some training uh we'll do a call and get you jacked dope dope well i mean shoot dude like i've been seeing your posts and uh i always like when people are giving putting out fitness influencing positivity out there and uh because it's something that i've I've taken upon to have it as a high priority, if not yeah. the highest priority in my day is to get my day started off the right way physically. That's awesome. And, and that has done wonders for the rest of my life mm -hmm. after that business relationships, just overall mood. Yeah. Um, and I so, know you know, I, when people tend to put physical um, progress at a backseat, uh, what people don't understand is that they're really putting their whole life at a backseat. Mm -hmm. The moment that you put that as a backseat, the whole, your whole life's going to take a hit. Yeah. It's like and so you really, I mean, right. Like that's, <laughs> that's your locomotive to getting around this world. Yeah. And so I always, once again, thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, I, I know for a fact that a lot of our viewers are benefiting from all of our guests who are focusing on mental and physical health because mm -hmm. that, that's a, that's something that so many people or I'm, I'm not gonna say so many i'm gonna say we all struggle with it mm -hmm. day in and day out even from the most fit people trying to stay fit from the people who are not fit trying to get fit yeah and i uh, say i'm not an expert you know you should become an expert in your own body right i can i help people on their journey i help people become experts for themselves you know teach a well, teach a man to fish right right and uh he'll have uh, fish for life yep yep exactly cool. thank you lucas um but hey man i appreciate you and uh 
there you have it, guys. Uh, another great episode from Appropriate Culture. We're going to be with you guys next week. And aside from that, we're going to be having some updates with uh, some new setup, new studio coming up uh, in about a week. Actually, we're going to be having a little more professional setup. But aside from that, you guys can find us at appropriateculture.com. Have a nice day. We'll see you guys in the next one. All right. Thank you. Take it easy. Thanks for watching this episode from Appropriate Culture. If you want to watch other episodes, make sure to make your way to appropriateculture.com. You can also hang out with us in other social media platforms. They're all in the link in the description. And aside from that, if you want to listen to the podcast on other platforms like Audible, um, Spotify, any of those, you can also find us there as well. Link in the description. Take it easy, guys. Have a good day.